right? Amen. We are looking in the book of Philippians for our Bible study. The book is Philippians chapter 2. We are again in the Philippians chapter 2, and we're glad to have everyone listening who is listening. Uh, we, uh, we are glad to be able to honor God even in these terrible times. Amen. We live in perilous times, and because we live in perilous times, we still need to be honoring God, amen? And we've come tonight to honor him just as we do in good times, amen? Amen. And so we have to walk by faith, uh, not by sight, and we have to be cautious as we walk. Of course, we are we're in tune with the professionals in the medical profession, and we want to honor their request so we can make sure that God is able to bless us in the midst of, of these times. Amen? And so we're going to honor what, what the professionals ask us to do, and we're going to continue to do what God is asking us to do. Amen? So we're here tonight in Bible study again. We're at Philippians chapter 2, and in your studies you know that in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is the first pericope, and verses 1 through 4, as you know, gives us four different, uh, four different truths, and then it backs up with another four different truths. So we want to pick those four truths out, these total of eight truths out of these first four verses tonight, right? So we want to make sure that God speaks to us through his word. As we have talked uh, for the last few weeks, we, we understand that Philippians chapter 1, Paul is writing this letter, and he knows his death is near, right? He has gone on his second missionary journey. Uh, he's locked up in a Roman jail. He talks about the fact that he has been hard-pressed on every side. Many times we find ourselves hard-pressed and we give up on God. We quit on him. We, we decide we're not going to follow God anymore and he's not worth following, following him. And so uh, Paul says that there's a different way. And in the process of demonstrating the fact that there's a different way, he found himself being a testimony even in a prison cell. All right. He says, well, I want to thank you, church at, at Philippi, for being who you are and doing what you do. I want to thank you for your contributions. I want to thank you for all that you've done for me. I want to thank you for supporting the ministry and financially supporting the preacher. My, my, my. So he talks about that, and he says it really well, and he thanks him for that. Mama and Daddy would say that if anybody do, does anything good for you, you ought to be kind enough and sense enough just to say thank you. So he writes this letter telling them thank you. He writes this letter letting them know that they have begun a good work. God has begun a good work in them, and therefore they are doing a great work. And he says to them, the work that God has started in you, he will continue it to the day of Jesus Christ. Right there in the first chapter, he talks about the fact that my heart goes out to you. He says that you're in my heart. And I told you before that the New Beginning Church is in my heart. It's in my heart. Matter of fact, since we're not hugging right now during this season, uh, just, just lay your hands. So David taught me this and and along with the, the Hispanics uh, on Sunday, they, they taught me if, they, if you're getting close and somebody wants you to want to know that you really, really want to hug them and love on them, just touch your heart. Just, just touch your heart. Oh, you, you're in my heart. So I just want to say, now, now sisters may do it like this, you're in my heart. Brothers may do it like this, you're in my heart. You know, there has to be a difference, right? There has to be a difference. And so, so men do what men do. Sisters do what sisters do. Are you with me? So, so Paul says to the church at Philippi, you are in my heart. You got my heart. Matter of fact, I think about you. I pray about you. You're in my heart. I say to the New Beginning Church, you're in my heart. You just, you just got my heart. You're in my heart. That's why I spend time praying for you when you're not praying for yourself. Uh, praying for you when you're sleeping, snowing, and slobbing. Uh, spending time trying to map out a different direction that we can go in so God can bless us all as one group. So Paul says that you're in my heart, and, and because you're in my heart, you have also been the confirmation to me in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is praying as preachers are praying, they want confirmation from the Lord. 
and you, because you are walking in the Lord, you are my confirmation. You have been confirmation to me in Jesus Christ, and you are partakers with me of the grace of God. God has blessed me. He has blessed you. He has blessed us together, and because he's blessing us together, that's a good thing, isn't it? Amen. Because when one of us is are blessed. One of us is blessed, then all of us are blessed. That's right. When one of us uh, get receive a blessing, we all rejoice, don't we? Right. We Paul says, "I am blessed by the grace of God, and I'm blessed by you." And because of that, uh, we have not only do you have my heart, we have also affection of Jesus Christ. Yes. God is proud of His children when they do what God has called them to do. God is excited when he is able to hear you repeat his words. Yeah. Not that he needs you to repeat them for his sake, but he is, he is excited when you repeat and recite his word when you're in trouble. Yeah. You don't need to fight it out. You don't need to cuss it out. You don't need to talk it out. Sometimes you just need to talk to God and tell God you said in your word. So we have to pray over his word, meaning God, we pray over your word. We ask you to reveal your word to us. We pray over your word, Lord. We ask you to lead us by way of your word. And then we have to pray God's word. We have to pray God's word. God, bless us, uh, bless us according to your word, for your word says this. There's nothing better than a parent hearing his child or her child reciting what they have taught them over the years. Amen? Amen. So God, God is excited about us, and we ought to be excited about God. Uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 8 that God has highly exalted man. God has exalted man because he asked the question, God, why do you even think of man like you think of? He has placed man above any animal. I know that animal lovers going to kill me on this one. But God is more concerned about man than he is about animals. Yes, <laughs> God is more concerned about the person who has a soul yes. than he is about an animal that has no soul. Is that news to you? True. Is that news? So God is so concerned about us that he wants us. The psalmist says in Psalmist 8 that you have created us a little lower than the angels. God has exalted us. He has built us up above all other creations, just a little lower than angels. The psalmist asked the question, God, who is man that you are mindful of him? That you come and visit him? That you spend time with him? Who is he? Man is just dust, but God loves man. And we ought to love man. Now, when I say man, I mean the human race. I mean the entire. God loves all of mankind. He loves it. All right. And this I pray for you. Verse number nine, he talks about the fact that I pray for you that, that you may still abound in all that you've been doing, that you will abound in the excellency of God, that you will abound in knowledge. He rushes to verse number 21 and says that God is the reason why I live. Yeah. Let's read with verse 21. In, in, in verse 21 he says, For to me to live is Christ, yeah. and to die is gain. Right. Paul says to us today that if you're not living with Christ, for Christ, and for the benefit of Christ, you just exist. Mm -hmm. Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. My, my, my. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What is it saying here? What, what is Paul saying that's, that's for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain? Come on, talk to me. He said to live in Christ, he has peace, he has understanding, he has love toward other people. Other than himself, he has a lot of joy in his life. Okay. Understanding. So when you live for Christ, all these things come into play, right? Yes. Sir. When you don't live for Christ, what happens? You blame. Uh, Bill Bright has a demonstration in his book, uh, this the book of demonstrating the four spiritual laws. 
in the back of that book, he had he shows two different orders. Number one, he shows a, a circle. In the first order, he shows a circle. And in that circle, he shows a cross on the outside of the circle. And then you see things all in an array on the inside of the circle. It shows the person inside of the circle, the cross on the outside of the circle, and total chaos is going on inside of the circle where the person is. The next demonstration Bill Bryce does is he has a circle where he has a cross inside of the circle, and the cross is sitting on a throne. And... Everything in the circle has its place. Everything is lined out. Everything is neat. There's no chaos in the circle at all. When you do not live for Christ, your life will be turmoil and chaos. Yes, indeed. Bill Bright is saying to us tonight that your life will be chaos if you don't have Jesus on the throne inside of your circle. And many people have Jesus on the outside of the circle. Some people miss church when it's, it's not a COVID-19 out there. Some people don't talk to God all day long. Some people don't read his word in a whole week. And then they come to church and say, that preacher ain't saying anything to me. <laughs> you got to prime the pump. You got to put something in. See, see, all y'all always had running water, right? Y'all, you all, all had, always had running water. But back home, we had to prime the pump. But once you got the pump, 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 the pump prime, you can get ice cold water with no deep freeze around. But you can take nasty, filthy, dirty water out of the ditch. Pour it in the top of the pump. Some of y'all are too cute for that. But, but you take nasty, dirty water out the ditch. Pour it in the top of the pump and just keep pumping the pump and clean water will come out. When you got God in your life, he can do that. You forget all the tadpoles you pouring in the pump. You forget all the little squiggly worms that you pouring in the pump. Y'all too cute, see y'all. Y'all used to turn it on the faucet and when you, when you turn the faucet on, something happened. We, we used to walk down to Mama Clyde's house and we would prime the pump. Pour a nasty, nasty cup of water, a rusty can of water over in the pump. Keep pumping the pump and after a while the nasty water just has to subside and clean, fresh water comes out. I can tell you all were born with a gold spoon in your mouth because you can't identify. We had to prime the pump. The reason why people do not hear from the Lord is because they don't get along with the Lord. You cannot expect the preacher to tell you everything you need to hear from the Lord. You need to study the word yourself. Amen. Because you all said it right. He's a man just like I am. He put on his bitches just like I do. But then you want to come to church and you say, teach me, preacher. Preach to me, preacher. Tell me, preacher, what the word says. Don't you know sometimes you just got to prime the pump? You got to come here ready? I can't go to that church. It's boring over there. Well, what did you do to make it exciting? I can't go to that church because they take up too much money over there. Well, Kroger's want a whole lot more. Sam. You will tip the waiter 25% and won't give God 10%. God, God is watching us. And his, his heart goes out to us. So for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul talks about the fact that if he departs from us, it won't help us very much. As long as he's here, let me tell you, as long as the preacher is here, it's a benefit for you. Whenever a church is vacant, whenever a church is vacant, it's not vacant because the deacon is not there. The church is never vacant because the choir director is missing. The church is not vacant because the ushers are not standing on the, on the, on the floor. 
The church is not vacant because the media ministry didn't show up on time. If so, our church would always be vacant. You knew I was going to go down that road, didn't you? The church is never vacant because the people are not in place. The church is only vacant when the past is not in the house. And we know it well because we'll say, oh, that's a vacant church over there. That, that doesn't mean that folk are not coming in and out. That means the man that stands behind the sacred desk of authority is no longer delivering the word there. He may have passed on. He may have walked out. Or commonly, he may have been dismissed. Now the church is fake. Mm, mm, mm. They say all oh, You don't have to say man all the time. Just say, mm, I see. <laughs> Nevertheless, if I remain in my flesh, that's good for you. Is Paul arrogant here? Is he bragging here? Or is he just telling the truth? He's stating the fact. As long as we take the statement the fact, we're not bragging, right? Amen. You know, and when we get to chapter 2, you're going to find out your attitude makes a difference. Okay? So Paul is saying, in this prison, the gods are getting saved. Paul is saying, there are some guys preaching, and they are not preaching to benefit God. They are not preaching to benefit the ministry. They are preaching because of selfish gain. And some of them, Paul said, are preaching to hurt me. Some of them are preaching to make me look bad. God deliver us from preachers that are preaching to make other preachers look bad. But then he also said there are some that are preaching the word of God. And they're preaching for Christ's sake. They're preaching for the right reasons. They're doing the right things. And check, check this out. Even those who are preaching with the wrong motive, Christ is still getting out. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to his disciples, disciples run to Jesus. The 72 that he sent out, the disciples run to Jesus. And the disciples say, now let me tell you something, God. Jesus, there are some people over there. They are casting out demons in your name. They are healing in your name. They are doing all kinds of miracles in your name. And they are not part of us. Jesus says, the word is being spread. Leave it alone. Isn't that something? It's a shame when we get to a point where we think our church is the only church doing the right thing. When, when our church is the only church that's saying the right thing. Doing it the right way. There are some denominations that have come to the conclusion we are the only right denomination on planet Earth. Well, what did people do before your denomination came into existence? Well, was God not pleased before your denomination showed up? I beg to differ because in Romans chapter 4, it says that Abraham did not stagger at, at the promises of God. It says that Abraham honored God, and it was considered righteousness to him. Paul says in verses 27 through 30, Philippians chapter 1, walk worthy of your call. Watch your conversation. Be careful with your conduct. Walk worthy. Now when he uses the word conversation, He's not talking about your mouth, even though your mouth will get you in trouble. When he uses the word conversation, in the original Greek, it means your life, your lifestyle, your conduct. Watch how you carry yourself. People are watching you as children of God. People are looking at you. People are determining whether they're going to follow the faith of the gospel based on what you do. In year 2020, this year came in with a bang, didn't it? It came in. If, if 2019 was not exciting for you, 2020 has come in with a bang. Millennials thought that 2019 was, was just so boring. I'll be glad when 2020 gets here. If 2019 was boring, well, you got 2020 on your hand now. It has come in with a bang. 
We're not even past the first quarter. <laughs> 2020 has 2020 said, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. It has come in with a bang. And therefore, we have to trust God through all that we do. We have to have faith in the gospel. That's why we cannot preach, teach, or live by a feel-good gospel. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew and to the Greek. Preacher said to me one day, he said, uh, he said you know what? You, you're not going to pack your church out preaching that old, same old gospel you've been preaching for the last 27 years. That's what he said to me. But there's one thing about it. God doesn't judge us on how we pack our churches. See, God is, is, is not moved by packed out churches. And truly, all preachers, all pastors want to pack them out and we want to see people come to the Lord and we want to see them dedicate themselves to him but the fact of the matter is, if a church is not growing numerically, it's really okay. If the church is not growing spiritually, that's a problem. When a church, see, because we don't, we, we can't determine who show up. Because the bottom line is, they can pack the church out Sunday, get mad at me Sunday, and never show up again. Because people get upset with the preachers. Not you all, but other folk. They, they get totally upset with the preaching. They just give up on God and give up on everything that God is all about. The Bible says you need to make sure that you walk worthy. You need to make sure that you strive together. You need to make sure that you deal with what God has put before you. And you deal with it worthy in a worthy manner. So Paul talks about the conflict. Paul talks about the conflict. And if you hadn't noticed, the conflict that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 1 is an external conflict. It's conflict from the outside. He says, I'm put in jail because of external conflicts. I'm locked up because of external conflict. I've been shift work by external conflict. <laughs> but when he moves to chapter 2 of Philippians, he's talking about an internal conflict. In chapter 1, he deals with what men are doing to the body of Christ. He deals with what men are doing to, to the believers. He deals with what men are doing against God. But when he gets to Philippians chapter 2, he deals with what men are doing within the body. Mm. Within the body of Christ. You know, you hadn't had a fight until you had a church fight. Man, when you have a church fight, you sure enough got something on your hand. Because church folks know how to fight dirty. They will never raise a gun at you, never raise a knife at you. But James said that thing between their lips will kill you. People, not at this church, but at other churches, the one around the corner down the street, people can kill you with their tongue, and people in church can gossip like nobody else. Because we think we've arrived and everybody else is wrong and we got it right. And because we got it right, then we know that we need to tell the world all their dirt. Big Mama said, never hang your dirty laundry on the front line. You know what I mean? Now, if you don't want your dirty laundry on the front line, should you put anybody else's out there? So Paul, in, in Philippians chapter 2, he deals with the lack of unity. He deals with the fact that we need to be unified. There are eight things between verses 1 and 4 that we need to find out tonight. And I know in your homework reading you, you found it out already. But let's look at this. 
chapter 2 of Philippians. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, key words here, any consolation in Christ, any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any, <laughs> if there's any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Let's stop there. Let's look at what he says. And I started just cover two verses tonight because they just packed, it's just, it's just packed with divine nuggets of truth. If there be any consolation, if there, now he talks about in chapter one, he talks about us getting it right. So he has to give them some encouragement. This word consolation means encouragement. He has to give us some, 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 he has to exhort us. He has to build us up. If there's any exhortation, if there's any encouragement, if there is any way we can build each other up, whatever you do, know that you're in Christ. If there's any constellation in Christ, if there's any encouragement in Christ, whatever you do, make sure, make sure you understand, first of all, you're in Christ. Secondly, you need to understand that there is some constellation, there is some building up, there is some, some motivation there is some encouragement in Christ Jesus. Be encouraged, my dear, in Christ Jesus. Regardless of what goes on around us, be encouraged. Regardless of what the elements of this world do, be encouraged. You got to be encouraged. You, you can't walk around with a, the world coming to the end attitude. But let me tell you a secret. You know what the world coming to? An end. Got a guy asked to preach the other day, man, this happened, this happened. What is the world coming to? He said, Ian. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. But there's one thing that I'm sure of. It won't come to an end until Jesus gets back. And when it does come to an end, I'll be out of here. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, he said, I need you to comfort one another with these words. He says, I don't want you to be ill-advised. I don't want you to be uninformed. I have you not to be ignorant, my brother, concerning those who are asleep in Christ. For those who are asleep in Christ, they will get up first at the trump of God, at the voice of the archangel. When Jesus cracked the sky, the same Jesus that died, rose, yes. got out of here on the cloud, he's going to show back on a, up on the cloud. Yes. Yes. So brothers, don't, don't, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers. I don't want you to be mis, mis, misled. I don't want you to be ill-informed. I don't want you to be uninformed. Just know that there's some consolation. Yes. Yes. There's some encouragement. Yes. Paul already said that if I'm in the body, I'm going to be here and I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to be here for you. Yeah. If I'm in the body. He also says, if I leave here, I'm going to be with the Lord, so I'm going to be, it's going to be a gain for me. I wonder how many of us really, really, really realize that it's a gain for us to get out of here. Are you ready? You may not have time to get ready. The signs are lining up right now. <laughs> Pestilence. The signs of sickness. A third of the world being wiped out. If the things are lining up. But it won't come to, to fruition until Jesus shows back up. The church is raptured out of here. Without a spot or wrinkle. And you know what? The only time you need to be concerned about your loved ones is while they are still living. The only time you need to be concerned about your spouse is when they're still living. Because one man asked Jesus, he said, this, you know, it was a traditional thing for, for men to marry their brother's wives when they would die. So 
One man would die, then the other brother would marry her. That brother would die, then the other brother would marry her. So a man asked Jesus, Jesus, when she get to heaven, whose wife will she be? Brother number one, two, or three. Jesus said, don't even worry about that brother. The relationships as you know it today will not be the same on the other side. So you can stop saying, I'm going to go and see my loved one when I get to the other side. You better love on your loved one on this side. Because when you get to the other side, the relationships are totally different. We all going to be unified around the throne of God, crying, holy, 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 is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. If there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation in Christ, just remember there ought to be some comfort of love. There ought to be some comfort. There ought to be some, some comfort of love. You ought to be, you ought to have some comfort. You ought to have some, some comfort of love. This word comfort is persuasion. You ought to be persuaded by love. You ought to be persuaded by love. A lot of people get married that say they love each other. Well, well. Man, I just love, what do you love about it? Oh, I love how she looks. But don't you know in a couple more years she ain't even look that way? I love how she walks. Don't you understand that she ain't going to be walking that way always? What you love about man? I just love her voice. Her voice can just just put me to sleep at night. But don't you know that voice gonna get raspy after a while? Man, I just love her pretty long hair. You don't know if it's hers or she bought it. Cause they got human hair now. Matter of fact, it could be short one day and long the next. So you can't, you can't have the comfort of love based on what you see. Right. Oh, I just love her little Coca-Cola bottle shit. Some of them gain and some of them lose. I just love the way, I just love the way he walks and how, how he looks. I love the color of his eyes. This love is not Eros love. This is dual love. Brotherly love and agape love. It is the love that a man has for another brother. It is brotherly love. When we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it is also agape love, meaning that I will go all the way with you. Some people will tell you, I'll go with you to the end now. You mess around and get sick, you're going to make somebody sick. They'll be there with you for a moment. They'll be, there, be with you for, for a while. But you mess around and stay sick, they paid you a visit one week. Then you were sick a second week. They paid you a half a visit. Then you were sick a third week. Then you better hurry up and get sick, get, get unsick. You better hurry up and get well because I'm sick and tired of showing up over here. And now everybody got an excuse. They may have that stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I can't go over there. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that was before the stuff showed up. So if there's any consolation, any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship, this word fellowship is kononia. It is the same word we get the word intercourse. It is the same word that we get the word communion and the word partnership. We are working together in fellowship. We're just glad to be around each other. We love helping each other out. He says, he said, well, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, you, you ought to be willing to partner with God and partner with each other. That's where this partnership. If there's any affection, Affection meaning is, is is there any any affection or sympathy or pity? Is, is there anything in your heart? Yes, that's right. It is compassion. compassion. Mercy. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have mercy on other folks? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just your folk. Mm. Or you want folk to have mercy on you? <laughs> the question is, are we walking according to what Paul describes here in verse number two? He says, fulfill my joy. Have you picked out your first four in verse number one? And then your second four is coming up in verse number two? I know you did in your spare time when you were... I mean, some of y'all at home now, huh? Mm. Look at God. He has placed you where you can, you can work all day and then you don't have to go far to get your Bible. Look at God. God is something else, isn't he? Now, you fought to read your Bible at work, but now God has put you right in front of your Bible. Are you using it? <laughs> they said, that crazy preacher there. He says, fulfill my joy. Fulfill, fulfill my joy. In other words, satisfy me. In other words, coincide with me. Fulfill my joy. There is nothing more joyful for a pastor than him to know that the people he's been teaching, the people he's been preaching to, are getting it. Yes, right. And they are living it. Mm -hmm. And they are walking on one accord. Paul says, coincide with me, co-labor with me, collaborate with me, satisfy me, fulfill my joy. Questions or comments? Fulfill my joy says, fulfill my joy, first of all, by being what? Being, being what? Like-minded. Like what does that mean, like-minded? Being, being like-minded. You, you ought to think the same way. Or think the same way. Or be, say again. On the same page. Be like-minded. Having the same love. Same, same goal. Now that's the next one. So he said, having the same goal, be like-minded. We, we, uh, we know that whenever we have a superstar on the team, that superstar can have an off day, right? Mm -hmm. Off night. Where am I headed? The whole team has to walk in unity. The whole team has to walk in. That, that's how it is in church. We are no stronger than our weakest link. That's right. That's, right. Mm -hmm. that's why we have to make sure that we approach people and ask them, man, is there something wrong? The reason why you hadn't shown up in the last month? Yeah. Or can we come to the conclusion that's just the way they are? No. Should we go looking for folk? Should we call them, text them? Should we go and ask them, is there anything that I can help you do to, to show up? Because whenever you're out there on your own, the devil makes prey of you. P-R-E-Y. He makes you a toy. He, to he toys with your mind. That's why little boys and little girls get in trouble when they don't take the person that they're spending time with before their parents. Even when we grew up, we had to know, yeah. we had to let our parents know who your folk, were. Right. who your folk, yeah, that's the question. It didn't, it, didn't make, it didn't make complete statements, but you understood right really away. Mm -hmm. you, you came into David's household, who your folk? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to make sure that we have the same common goals. Because we figured, if this is your child, and I know your parents, and your parents have this standard, then I know this child ought to have the same or like standards. We ought to be like-minded. We ought, we ought to be like-minded. Our hearts ought to be the same. We ought to be, our hearts ought to be to the same movement. It ought to be on the same rhythm. Our, our, we ought to have a heart for everything that the other person have a heart for. We ought to have the same heart. We ought to have the same mind. What's the next one, Brother Richard? Having the same love. Having the same love. This, this, this love that we have, we ought to have sustaining love. 
We are not to have to have a business meeting to vote on whether we're gonna love somebody. In, in, in the country, when a person come down the aisle, I used to wonder about that even as a boy. When a person come down the aisle and the person wanted to join the church, maybe we should be doing that more now than then. But if a person wanted to join the church, the, the, the pastor would say, now brother deacons and to the church, this person has come to join the church. Can I get a motion? Wow. Boy, you city folk. Look at you city folk, how you city folk looking at me. Can I get a motion? Should I give them the, the right hand of welcome and fellowship or not? They, they, brother, brother, pastor, I, I motion that, that we give Sister XYZ the right hand of welcome and the right hand of fellowship. Y'all never heard that before? No, no, no. Y'all been in the city too long. Everybody in the city from the country, you know that, right? Yeah. But y'all been in the city too long. Y'all forgot where you come from. But we ought to have the same love. We, we shouldn't have to vote on folk. Even if it's a criminal, we shouldn't have to vote on them. We ought to welcome them. I, I enjoyed the moment when I said to the New Beginning Church, I want all the prostitutes to come in New Beginning. I want all the drug dealers to come to New Begin. I want all the lesbian, all the homosexuals to come to New Begin. Somebody said, well, when they come, I'm leaving. The problem with that is you are a ex-something and you still is something. You still are something. It's just in your mind. Just, and that's what Paul is dealing with. He's dealing with a church that he's telling them whatever you do, Keep the same love. Keep the same mind. He commends them in chapter 1, gets to chapter 2, and tells them, now you look, y'all got to stay together. You got to come together. Don't let little, little clicks throw you off. I told you what my terminology of a click is, right? A click is nothing but a spiritual gang in the church. That's, it's just a game. You've heard the pastor say, my gang is here tonight. So what he did is just turn out, shut the rest of us down. He doesn't care if we say amen or not. He got his gang here tonight. Well, you should have stayed at your church and preached to your gang. We ought to have love for folk. We, we ought to have the same love for people. We should not argue about how we love people. Back home, they say, we need love that runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. We really genuinely love each other. Girl, did you know she had to come get me some sugar? Oh, oh man, must have really got laid off last night. We didn't do that back home. We, we, we love each other. Go, go next door and get three eggs and come next door and get some sugar. That was love. Kill a hog and everybody. Everybody on the whole plantation. See, y'all don't know what a plantation living in. It is either do you. Everybody on the plantation eat off one hog or two hogs. And they eat for that season. Then when hog killing time shows up again, they, everybody else eat. Because they had love for each other. The next one, being on one accord. The first one he says, have the same mind. And then he says, be on one accord. <laughs> Now, you got a heart to do what's right, but are you doing it? When you're on one accord, you're going to do it. You're going to really, really do it. If you're on one accord, you're going to do what the Bible says to do. You're going to do what the Bible says to do. We go all. And if somebody come to me and say, well, well, Pastor, one of the new beginning members, because you're not my member. <laughs> you know, I hear preachers say that. But you're not my member. You're God's member, right? You're a member of the New Beginning Church. So, so when, when someone comes and says, one of the New Beginning Church members said that, I'm going to stand flat foot and say, no, they don't do that at the New Beginning Church. Now, you got the wrong person. You, you have the wrong church. Because I can stand and tell you, that member wouldn't do that. Now, here's the question. If you hear something about your pastor. So I knew that Joker would do all he dropped off the beat. I knew he would. <laughs> I knew he would. I went to the prison and preached at the prison for seven years. And after seven years of preaching, 
there was a preacher on on TV that was in handcuffs. As I was leaving, they had they had the TV on, so I stopped and talked to the brothers because I went down there and I, I talked to them and then I ate with them and then I sat in the recreation hall with them. And they, they had a preacher in handcuffs. And everybody had a different opinion of what happened. So I asked the question, I said, brothers, what would you say if you saw me in handcuffs? Plastered all over the TV. And when I asked the question, I really wanted an honest answer. And I got an honest answer. I got several answers. First of all, the guy said, well, I don't think that you would do what they're accusing you of. Another guy said, well, I would have to know what the charges are. Another guy says, well, I would like to know if they got videos and pictures of you doing it. <laughs> and the last guy said, I would say I knew he was into something. He couldn't have been that clean. <laughs> so, so he come down here and preach to us, but I knew he wasn't that clean. I knew he was into something. And he, he came to that assumption even without knowing what the preacher had been involved in. So if I can stand flat footed and say, no, she wouldn't do that. Question is, would you be able to say that about your past? No, that's not who he is. Then finally, he says, "Be of one mind. Be of one mind. You, you shouldn't have to vote on stuff." When you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't take a vote to decide whether they were going to buy that. <laughs> they didn't say, "Hey, let us go, King, and talk about it." Let us go and, 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 and rash this thing out, King. They didn't say that. All three of them had come to the same conclusion. We are not going to bow down to an idol God. Well, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. That didn't change their minds. We are not going to bow down to an idol God. My question today is, how many members of the New Beginning Church can I depend on to never bow down to idol gods? <laughs> well, we're going to lock you up, but I can't bow down. I oftentimes tell the story about mass men running into a church with mass, mass owning guns, guns in their hand. Said, all of the Christians get on this wall, all who are not Christians get on this wall. The ones of you who are Christians on this wall, we're going to kill all of y'all. The pastor got on the wall. About 10 members got on the wall. About 300 of the jokers got on this wall. The pastor over here with 10 members. About 300 over here. And so the masked men said, okay, all 300 of you who are no longer Christians or have never been Christians, you all can leave. We're going to kill these 11 people. So you got the pass at 10 on this wall. 300, I mean, they rushing out the door. Folk that were on walking cane was running. People left their wheelchairs. People left their scooters. They had people that hadn't run in years. Well, out the front door. <laughs> then all six masked men took their mask off. So, okay, Pastor, we can really have some church now. All the fake Christians are gone. Will you buy down? Or will you honor God? He says that we all must have one mind. So no church is any stronger than its weakest link. I grew up riding bicycles in the, in the, in the dusty roads of Mississippi. And when we rode bicycles, every now and then the chain would jump the track. And when the chain dropped, jumped off the, the, sprock, the sprocket, we would, we would stop right there, put it back on, tighten it up. But after you tighten it up so many times, sooner or later, it's going to break the chain. And, and they had a link in the chain where you can take one link out 
and put a replacement in there or put several replacements in there. That chain was never stronger than that one link that was weak. It was the weakest link. But guess what? We couldn't ride the bike without the weakest link. Couldn't ride it without the weakest link. No church is going to be very successful when you got weak links that's holding it back. We got to have one mind. We have to reach souls for Christ. We have to be about Christ's business. We have to be adamant about reaching people, regardless of their background, regardless of their color, regardless of their creed, regardless of their language. The Bible teaches that God honors and he's going to one day bring together men from all different nations, all tongues, all background, all shades, and all hues. God is concerned about all of us. We have to be of one mind. And you know, just the other day, I, I went to the city of Houston to, to talk about housing, and, and I learned something. I really learned something down there. I used to wonder why they would say that we will not discriminate regardless of race, creed, or color. I always thought it was a, it was a redundant statement when they said race or color. But I found out something about us people. Because if you're light-skinned, you're one color. You're dark-skinned, you're another color. And people actually discriminate based on the color of your skin. But now, I'm going to tell you, I never would have made it in because I'm, I'm just black. Some of you all that's got that light tone, you would get housing and I wouldn't get it. I would be outside. I've learned that people will discriminate based on what you look like. The pretty girls always get to be chillies. And they're too cute to open their mouths. People discriminate based on what you look like. That ought not be in the church. The church ought to be of one mind that we are looking for souls for Jesus Christ. We are here to make sure that men get fair shakes. Everybody knows what Proverbs 31 says, right? If you look very closely at Proverbs 31, there's a verse. I think it's 18 or 19 maybe 18, Proverbs 31 says, I am here to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. We have to make sure that we participate in what is known as prophetic leadership. Now, I'm not talking about prophesying. Prophetic leadership is when you speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves. One thing I learned at, at, at an early age in Mississippi, I learned that if they bullet him today, they're going to bullet me tomorrow. Yes, so I got with him. I said, look, man, they bullet you. If both of us walk in there together, they ain't going to bully both of us. I went to a high school that was 98% African American. And, and then there were two, three Asians and, and about five different uh, 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 Anglos and there was an Anglo boy that was very smart so he was in 12A I think they just put me in 12A but I don't want a smart folk work they just stuck me in there people like Ray Matthews was in there Greg Tillman, Oscar Butler and they just put me in 12A because cause they was graduating cum laude, I'm graduating thank you Lord. So they had all these people in 12A, right? And there was this one white boy that was in there, and he was in 12A. And this boy was sharp as a whip. Don't you know that he was my friend? <laughs> Wasn't a brother on campus going to mess with him because we studied together. The bottom line is we ought to be willing to speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves. We are about winning souls for Christ and making sure that those souls are disciples for Christ. Let nothing be done, verse number three, Philippians chapter two, let nothing be done through selfish ambition 
or conceit, but in the lowness of mind, let everyone esteem others better than himself. Let nothing be done. Let absolutely nothing be done for your selfish ambition. You know, people do things so they can get something. People say, oh, you, they start talking different when certain people show up. I can just tell when supervisors was on the floor. Folk that were ghetto before the supervisors show up, now they're all proper and still breaking birds. You know, if you don't practice something, even when the boss shows up, <laughs> you still can't come up with it. So, I can always tell who people are talking to based on how they're speaking. You can tell when a person is talking to a person, a person who is in it for selfish ambition and selfish gain, their voice changes. And they think they're getting real proper. And they, they begin to say I when you should say me. They begin to say me when they should say I. They begin to say them when they should say they. And the world's worth is there and, and they say that. The bottom line is we ought to not do anything because of our selfish ambition. We do stuff for people that, that, that can do stuff for us. We can't do that. We can't live our lives like that. Neither can we live for our selfish conceits. We can't live so, so we can be put on a high level. It says, but lowly. Lowness of mind. Lowly. Boy, daddy was real good with that word low. He never wanted to fly in a plane, never wanted to fly in a helicopter. So he, he began to quote Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, where it says, God said, Lo, he'll be with you, not high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, God says, Lo, he will be with you always, yeah. not high. <laughs> but this lowness is, is, he's talking about coming down off your high horse. Get down off your pedestal. Stop being somebody that you're trying to create. People, people in debt now because they've been trying to create something. Joneses get it. I got to have one. Yeah, that gang, that's a neighborhood gang there. Living like the Joneses. Y'all heard that song before? The Joneses? Living like, I know Sister Davis never heard, you know, that, that wasn't a church song, so Sister Davis never heard that one. <laughs> you know, you can't live like the Joneses. Don't do what the Joneses do. Now, it's not talking about the family called Jones. What it's talking about, your neighbor gets something, or your friend or your coworker gets something, you go buy it, and you can't pay for it. Right. So what you have to do is live lowly and let God bless you. See, God talks like this. The first shall be last. The last shall. And if you live for the Lord, he'll elevate you. He will lift you up. You just remain low, even in your mind. Let each one esteem others better than himself. You ought to support other people. Other people ought to be more important to you than you are to yourself. Now, what did I just say now, that, that, sounds, that sounds real spiritual, doesn't it? But the fact of the matter is, we have to get to a point in our lives where we consider other people. That's right. You know, when you went to, went to the store the other day and got your can of beans and your toilet paper, you should have gotten some for your neighbor right. who couldn't afford it. That's right. Got your case of water, you should have gotten some for your, your church person that couldn't afford it. And it doesn't matter how they got in that situation. Some of us come to the conclusion, oh, if he hadn't have been living like this, he wouldn't be in this situation. Well, let me tell you something. If it had not been for God's amazing grace, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in. It's not because you're so smart. It's because God is so good. And he's good all by himself. So we have to put other people 
and esteem them more than we esteem ourselves. Let each one of us look out only for his own interest. Look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. We have to put people in a position where we can bless them and not talk about it. The problem is, if we bless you, we're going to tell everybody about it. You have to put yourself in a position and put other people in a position where they can be blessed by you and no one ever knows about it. Put other people first. Questions or comments? I know y'all got a lot of comments. Yes, ma'am. A lot of comments. Yes, sir. Anybody? A lot of comments. Because you did your homework, you got your work done, and you studied. So we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, 3, and 4 for next week, right? So somebody tell me about Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Boy, when I get to this point in the lesson, people start running and flipping pages and looking around and, and looking down. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. We got to live for Christ. We got to pull together, live in harmony. What are the eight things that we pointed out in verses one through four? There are eight things we pointed out in verses one through four. We got to be encouraged. We're, we're in Christ, so we got to be encouraged. We, we got to be like minded. Got to work together. Got to work together. We're going to come up with 15 of the same mind. Anybody else? Love one another. We got to love, have the same love. Right, we got to be, if there's any consolation, if there's any encouragement, we ought to be exalting and be encouraged that Jesus is on our team and we're on his team. That's good news, I'm telling you. We're on Jesus' team. That is good news. Anything else? Self-ambition. We Say again? Self-ambition. Self-ambition, what about it? You don't do things to... All right, you don't do things for self gratification and your own self ambition. Anybody else? Look out for others. Look out for others. Yeah. Look out for other people. When you bought your hand sanitizer, you should have bought some for your neighbor. Your co some people bought them for their co worker because they don't want them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't buy it and sell it. And, and, and create an exorbitant price because, uh, because the law is supply and demand. You have to look out for people. Look out for each other. Watch what God does. When you walk in faith, you can get rid of some things because you know God is going to add to it. God always gives us double for our trouble. Always. You know, I, I watch people just holding on to that dollar. They hold, well, that's all you're going to ever have is a dollar. You hold, God wants you to open your hand so you can get $100, but you're holding on to that dollar. And the good thing about God, he gives you more than what you need at the best time and the right time you need it. Because he's God. He knows everything. He does all things well. Amen? Amen. Questions or comments? It's about Jesus, and that's how we ought to be. We, it ought to be about Jesus. It ought to be about God. It ought, it ought to be about the Holy Spirit. If you look at it throughout these four verses, it's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about walking in Christ. It's about being like Christ, having this mind. Later on, we're going to talk about let this mind be in you that's already in Christ Jesus. Having a heart for people. Having a heart for Christ. Let this mind be in you. Yes, ma'am. Sharing with someone today is that I think one of the things we're going to see more of uh, during this season, for however long it is with this virus, is that you're going to see people becoming more creative in how they can help each other, and they're not even Christians. Yes. Because they're just neighborly. So for right. those of us who are supposed to be Christian, we should be out at the forefront. Yeah. Doing exactly what the word says, 
look at them with the name, because that's what we that's who we are. Yes. And not afraid to go to a house of worship, but where's your faith? Well, wait a minute. So what about God being, you know, covered by the blood and looking at them? So you saying that he doesn't do this, so why would I join your church? Why would I join your faith? Mm -hmm. You don't trust it. So some of the, I've heard some comments like that, but I think when I'm looking at things, people are coming up with, even in the school system where we work, people are coming up with all kinds of th ways to teach, to share, to help each other because it's <coughs> mandated. Right. Or because I just, well, I can't do this, but let me just try to do this and give you this because yeah. we're all in this. Right. And, and one thing that you will hear the news reporters say over and over again, whether it's a hurricane or disaster uh -huh. or it's a virus yeah. or it's a disease. One thing they would say over and over again, Houston yeah. is strong well, because they stand together. together. Right. But you do know the whole world is standing together, right? Yes. Yes. I told Sister Davis today it's about time somebody come up with another song like We Are the World. Yeah. Yeah. Because we need to, we need to make sure uh, that that everybody come together. Yeah. If I could get in touch with Trey, Trey the Truth, I've already uh, uh, hit him up and he hadn't hit me back. So if you know Trey the Truth, tell him to get back with me. I want to write a song with him and I want him to take the cussing out, but I want him to write a song with me because he has a heart. He has a heart for giving back to the to the community. And I just want to share the book of Psalms with him and so I can tell him where to go and he can put it in words. Are you with me? And we need another song like We Are the World. We are people. Yeah. We can make it a brighter day if we come together. Yeah. Are you with me? We need another song like We Are the World. I be singing that song, y'all. I can sing it. I can sing that. And I can sound just like Michael Jackson. I can sound like the rest of them. I can sing that song. We, we need another song. I want some, I want some of that stuff, y'all. <laughs> We, we need another song that will get everybody's attention. That's true. We need to bring them on in. We have to make sure we stand together and love people because that's what Jesus was about. And he covered everybody on the cross. Died for everybody and he didn't leave anybody out. And he rose for everybody. He didn't leave anybody out. And, and this is a good time for people to get to know Jesus and, and, and just commit to him. We don't need another 9-11 or a coronavirus. We need Jesus. And, and Jesus, if we lift him, he'll drop. We just got to let him, let him drop. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless you now. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another chance to study your word. We ask you to bless your word to become real to us. Bless your word, Father God, that we will take your word to others and that others will see you in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Let me thank those who joined us by live broadcast. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sheremont Road, Houston, Texas. If you're ever in the Houston area, please come by and visit with us. If you want to contribute to our ministry, you can do so by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls, NBC Souls. Please join us as we continue to get the word out and let men, women, boys, and girls know that Jesus yet lives. Thank you, God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer.